This video is part two of my series on why I prefer anarchism to Marxism and its offshoots. This video asks why the left would focus so much on anti-imperialism and anti-capitalism, but not on anti-authoritarianism more broadly. I spent some time in my last video on why the problem is not so much certain states or especially powerful ones, but all states, regardless of the ideology they claim to follow, and all concentration of power, regardless of what it's for. So, what is this authority I think we should oppose? It's one of those words that has two distinct meanings that sometimes get conflated. An authority could just be someone who knows stuff. I'm an authority on how to speak English, for example. You might be too. The second meaning of authority is the state and its representatives, or others in positions of power. You need the first kind of authority to do things only an authority knows how to do. If only one of us knows how to fix an air conditioner, that person is the authority. We can work together, they can tell me how I can help them, but they won't threaten me with violence if I don't help them. They won't give me orders and tie my hands together and put me in a cage if I don't obey. They won't remain forever a permanent authority, always assuming I need their guidance. Authority, the second kind, always excuses itself with altruism. We exist to serve you, it says. But really, authority exists so others will serve it. Authority gives the orders, the rest of us do the work. I think we should oppose all such authority. It's generally assumed on the left that capitalism and imperialism are bad. Why? Well, the simplest answer is because we should be free. Those systems are systems of violence that enslave people to produce for the benefit of people at the top of the hierarchy. That makes these systems authoritarian. They have a monopoly on deciding who the authorities are and how to exercise that power. Authoritarianism is not usually used to describe individual action. It refers to permanent institutions of hierarchy, systems that exist for the purpose of concentrating power. All states are authoritarian. All states perpetuate and normalize authoritarianism by spreading the idea that a few people should have power over most. This power is exercised through violence. That violence trickles down to create callous people, abusive relationships, and divided communities, plus a bunch of bootlickers who will do the work of the state without getting paid for it. Why would you be opposed to things like imperialism and capitalism, but not the systems and ideologies they grow out of? If you're against capitalism, well, where does capital get its power from? What would capitalism be without a state? How would capitalists impose their will on us? They wouldn't be able to force us to work or go hungry if there were no money and taxes and laws. Capitalism is statism. It came from the state. It's implemented and protected by the state. It couldn't exist without the state. Capitalism isn't separate or fundamentally different from statism. In fact, as statism has always been based on forced labor, including in the so-called socialist states, I see capitalism as merely a refined form of statism, necessary for an age where you can't get people to work just because it pleases the gods. What about imperialism? Lenin said imperialism was the highest stage of capitalism. But that was a hundred years ago, before World War I. He was writing about that moment in time. Imperialism has evolved considerably since then. What's more, imperialism predates capitalism. Imperialism can grow out of capitalism because capital represents power, and it's always seeking new places to suck dry. 
But all concentration of power leads to seeking more power. Because power is like a drug. Hierarchical society as we know it started thousands of years ago, but nobody controlled vast swaths of the world back then. They started small and kept getting bigger. Even now that they're hemmed in by international law, functioning states strengthen their power over people every day. What's the difference between an imperialist state and a non-imperialist state? Well, one only dominates the people under its national jurisdiction. An empire goes beyond those borders. If it's bad to dominate people outside your borders, why is it okay to do so inside them? Because we've been told all our lives states represent the people? States were the same as empires until 1648, and now we call them nation-states. Why anyone calling themselves a communist would believe in that system is beyond me. It's a system that's constantly moving away from communism and toward more concentrated power and wealth. I think the term anti-imperialism is a leftover from the USSR, an empire that always called its enemies the real imperialists. Anti-imperialism's not a principle. It's saying you oppose the biggest bully in the playground, regardless of what anyone else is doing. And I've noticed that in practice, it only means opposition to the US and its closest allies. Not enough Marxists care about the violence in China, Vietnam, North Korea, and so on, because those states claim to be anti-imperialist. So we have to support them no matter what they do. Is it Surprising that the so-called socialist states like the USSR expanded their borders repeatedly? That's what powerful states do if they can. Of course it had excuses, like relocating unruly peoples and creating a buffer zone, but what it wanted was more influence and more power. It begs the question to say all those things were necessary for survival, but if you believe in what states tell you, you might just accept it. It's not just capitalism that causes expansion. It's any concentration of power. Empires existed long before capitalism, and they will exist after capitalism if the left continues to see capitalism as the only problem and the state as neutral. How could you possibly call the USSR anti-imperialist. In what sense was it opposed to empire building? It was a continuation of the Russian Empire, with all the same territory held together by the same central force, with the same ethnic cleansing too. It was just a rival empire to the US. To think all imperialism comes from the US is silly. But this is why when talking about state or empire, or authoritarianism for pragmatic reasons and authoritarianism for capitalist reasons, the distinctions are moot. The anarchist principle is to, po to oppose all of it, because it's all force preventing people from being free, distorting the idea of justice, giving us one version of the truth. Do you only oppose those things when the U.S. does them? Because if so, you won't recognize or try to stop tyranny if anyone else does it. You might defend it, because it's in the name of anti-imperialism. Leninists and others tell me socialism is a transition phase, when the rightly guided caliphs of Marxism will get rid of all the reactionaries, devolve control of the means of production to the proletariat, and then just make itself obsolete, write itself out of existence. So, like, when's that going to start? When have Leninist regimes done those things? Hearing that reminds me of election promises. We will eliminate corruption and give power back to the people. Thank you. Thank you. A revolution the way some socialists seem to envision it would do little to improve material conditions or liberate anyone. It's just a promise for the future, which is still in the hands of a state that you have to hope is on your side, even though all history suggests it isn't. I get told a lot that the left 
needs a state to eliminate bourgeois and fascist reaction. Thing is, we actually know from experience we don't need a state to counter fascists because we're already doing it. Look how many people are online right now identifying and doxing fascists or are in the streets protecting people from white supremacist gangs. States sometimes ally with or co-opt these people for their own interests. In the absence of a state, resisting fascism would no longer be illegal. If the point of a dictatorship of the proletariat, and I'm going to make a whole video on that in this series as well, is to defend against bourgeois reaction, then why do post-revolutionary states try to concentrate power over every aspect of society? Not only do they not trust the people they claim to believe in to defend themselves, those same people aren't allowed to educate themselves or coordinate production or whatever. Only a small cadre of people will make all the decisions and impose them on everyone because they are the enlightened ones. Sure, you can add a few GDP points that way, but you'll have to hope it's equally distributed and hope it leads to improvements for everyone, just like we hope the people wielding power plan to let go of it in the future, which is simply unrealistic. I wonder if my problem is simply that so many of the leftists I know are Americans. Obviously, Americans are a diverse bunch, but one thing most of them have in common is knowing next to nothing about the world outside the U.S., you know, unless they're immigrants. The right wing seems to think everything is better in the U.S. because patriotism clouds your thinking, while the left seems to think everything they've ever heard about the rest of the world is CIA propaganda, which is sometimes accurate, I'll admit, but it tends to translate to easily falling for the propaganda of other states, like China. So they'll read U.S. government propaganda and say, oh, that's silly, who could ever believe that? And then hear Chinese government propaganda say the same thing and just accept it uncritically. Or Russian propaganda. Look how many on the left support Bashar al-Assad because he's allied with Putin. They say the US and its allies are the aggressors in Syria. When, if you actually look at how the revolt went down, it's obvious Assad and his army have been the aggressors from the start. I doubt U.S. involvement made things better, just like it made Libya worse. But again, Gaddafi didn't start that by four decades of autocracy, maybe? No blame for him at all? No? Okay. It's always the U.S.'s fault, and if you believe anything else, you're just falling for imperialist lies. It's so reductionist. No room for nuance, no room for questioning. It often dismisses popular movements, which is so ironic, because Marxists claim to champion popular movements. It wasn't people power, they, they might say, to, that took down dictatorships in Taiwan and South Korea and the Philippines and all over Latin America and Eastern Europe. No, it was just that the CIA's heart was no longer in it. The people have no agency. See, this Cold War mentality is not a useful base for analysis. You can actually be against all illegitimate authority, both foreign and domestic. If you don't oppose authority, I don't know if I really trust you to carry out a revolution that won't lead to another USSR. It means you don't trust the people to govern themselves. It can be hard for me to believe a lot of these leftists because of how little they seem to care about the cause of empowering the workers, or, or the people, and establishing communism. For example, one cause that should be a no-brainer for leftists is land back. Taking land from the state, or from landlords and corporations, and giving it to indigenous people whose land it was originally. It's much easier than overthrowing the government. The people are there, doing the work already. It's, it's as much an anti-imperialist movement as any movement around the world. But leftists find excuses. Like, what if the indigenous people committed genocide on us? These are not concerns rooted in reality, but in white people's fears of losing power. Leftists need to unlearn whiteness 
just like everyone else. For another example, look at how every popular movement outside the U.S. gets labeled a CIA color revolution. If every uprising is CIA, how will these people know when it's a real revolt, whatever that means? Look how many leftists refuse to support Ukrainian resistance to Putin because there are Nazis in Ukraine. That's all it takes for some people to lose all compassion. You're near some Nazis, so you can all die. Sounds like the mindset of a Reaper drone operator. Or look at the people who talk about how great Stalin was. They're claiming the mantle of communism while ignoring the forced labor of millions of workers. How's that communism? It's not. It's authoritarianism. It's hero worship. It's messianism. Why would we want a repeat of that? What happened to ruthless criticism of all that exists? We need a modern, expansive understanding of empire. What a lot of Marxists call anti-imperialism tends to present what I think is a really narrow understanding. Russia invades a sovereign state, but somehow that's not imperialism. Shit, Russia's always been an empire. How else do you think it got so big? But, but you know, according to our interpretation of a theory of imperialism from more than a hundred years ago we're still using for some reason, we will decide what is and isn't imperialism. We own the term, passed down to us from Lenin. So all other theories of imperialism are wrong. And that's how you get nominal leftists to support states killing thousands of people to maintain their own power. As Leila Ashami writes, oh, and trigger warning for the R word, this left exhibits deeply authoritarian tendencies, one that places states themselves at the center of political analysis. Solidarity is therefore extended to states seen as the main actor in a struggle for liberation, rather than oppressed or underprivileged groups in any given society, no matter that state's tyranny. Blind to the social war occurring within Syria itself, the Syrian people, where they exist, are viewed as mere pawns in a geopolitical chess game. They repeat the mantra, Assad is the legitimate ruler of a sovereign country. Assad, who inherited a dictatorship from his father and has never held, let alone won, a free and fair election. Assad, whose Syrian Arab army can only regain the territory it lost with the backing of a hodgepodge of foreign mercenaries and supported by foreign bombs, and who are fighting, by and large, Syrian-born rebels and civilians. How many would consider their own elected government legitimate if it began carrying out mass rape campaigns against dissidents? It's only the complete dehumanization of Syrians that makes such a position even possible. It's a racism that sees Syrians as incapable of achieving, let alone deserving, anything better than one of the most brutal dictatorships of our time. For this authoritarian left, Support is extended to the Assad regime in the name of anti-imperialism. Assad is seen as part of the axis of resistance against both U.S. empire and Zionism. It matters little that the Assad regime itself supported the first Gulf War or participated in the U.S. illegal rendition program where suspected terrorists were tortured in Syria on the CIA's behalf. The fact that this regime probably holds the dubious distinction of slaughtering more Palestinians than the Israeli state is constantly overlooked, as is the fact that it's more intent on using its armed forces to suppress internal dissent than to liberate the Israeli-occupied Golan. Because they take so many of their cues from authority, it's easy to find things like anti-Kurdish or anti-Ukrainian views expressed openly. Some leftists dismiss all anarchism as being white supremacist or CIA or some other nonsense and in the process minimize and ignore all anarchist movement outside Europe. Likewise, instead of listening to people and respecting everyone's existence, you get Marxists who have a problem with trans people or with sex workers. And by the way, there are anarchists who hold this kind of belief too, but they're usually quickly educated and if they persist, expelled from anarchist circles because hating on trans people and sex workers cannot possibly lead to liberation. 
So it's a clear violation of anarchist principles. Anti-imperialists nowadays focus on U.S. foreign and economic policy, which is important, but the empire is broader than the U.S. and its allies. I see the real empire as an empire of capital, which China, Russia, and even Vietnam are very much a part of. I don't like it when so-called anti-imperialists only oppose actions by certain actors. There are wars all over the world, but the only ones that matter are the imperialist wars of the U.S. military. Look how many people are claiming Putin's invasion of Ukraine is the fault of NATO. It boggles the mind how much effort people put into avoiding the basic facts. Every state takes from its citizens, but the U.S. is the worst, they assume. So the U.S. and its allies are the only ones we're going to criticize. Again, though, that's the thing about anti-imperialism. There's no principle behind it. They don't oppose social hierarchy as a rule, just states they call capitalists. They don't oppose the concentration of power in a few hands just when capitalists do it. If anti-imperialism were consistent, it would be anti-authoritarianism. Where one draws the line between state and empire is arbitrary. They're two slightly different kinds of institutions that exist to concentrate power. You don't want to break down all politics into camps like imperialist versus anti-imperialist or capitalist countries versus socialist countries. It leads to simplistic thinking on questions of, for example, Hong Kong, where countless people protested against rule by Beijing, braving a year of police violence, but most of Marxist Leninist social media was falling over itself trying to justify the violence. They think they have this perfect understanding of how the world works and that people's lives are never as important as immediate geopolitical concerns. Force external rule on these people because if Hong Kong belongs to China, everything the state does to the people is legitimate. Some people making decisions in Beijing are the legitimate owners of Hong Kong. You know, the landlords. Who cares if locals see it as external rule, you know, imperialism. They're wrong and I'm right. It's not really surprising so many on the left have reactionary takes. They don't try to imagine a new system with decentralized power relations, but just put themselves at the top of the hierarchy. They think they need to have some kind of answer to every question for when they're the president. And since they're hoping to have power, the answer is usually to limit freedom, rather than let people figure out things for themselves. So it's no shock that so many have jumped on the patriotic socialism bandwagon recently, or fall for the so-called red-brown alliance. To me, it's the same as the desire to support some state or statesman, whether or not it's socialist in practice, it's to be part of the winning team. But if winning, by your criteria, means imposing a new kind of tyranny on people, I don't care who wins anymore. I'll oppose all of them. It's like some Marxists think we need total conformity until the revolution when we're allowed to be free. I guess that's why they like so-called democratic centralism. The term is an oxymoron. If you want democracy, you don't centralize control. Centralization means ensuring only a few people who are close to the top of the hierarchy get to make the decisions. Only decentralization will lead to freedom. It's important to coordinate across locales, sure, for things like self-defense, food and energy production, that kind of thing, but centralizing important decisions is to replicate the system we have today. Undemocratic, unequal, oppressive, violent. Instead of harmonizing means and ends, there are a lot of Marxists who want revolution to replicate existing systems, just with more capable and incorruptible leadership. It doesn't matter what you claim are the intentions of the central leadership, they're going to get corrupted by power, which means they will never let go of it, and in fact, will try to expand on it. They'll put out propaganda about how it's not the right time to let the people have the power, and Leninists will believe it. 
We can't let go of one iota of power because it's not the right time. It'll only be the right time after there's this worldwide revolution and we're not going to do anything to foment revolution in other countries because we need trade and diplomatic recognition. I could write all their press releases. The pretext for all the counter-revolutionary violence and oppression and surveillance and gulags is always that we need to defend the revolution against imperialism and fascism. Well, what better way could there be to do that than destroying the central power and making the people independent so no one can dominate them again? Concerned people will defend their society if they aren't held back by a state. But instead, in the USSR at least, they kept the oppressive state apparatus intact for 70 years and, unsurprisingly, a capitalist state took its place with very little bloodshed with all the tools necessary to impose a neoliberal order on everyone. The problem's not just the state, as much as I focus on that. It's the nation, too. There's a tendency among Marxists to accept nationalism and nations the way they are, rather than trying to rise above them. Nationalism is hierarchical. We should be aiming for a non-hierarchical society. Nationalism would leave not only the imagined community of the nation, but also the state intact, as one presupposes the other. Nationalism provides us with enemies and outsiders. We should be aiming to include everyone, at least, at least over the long term. I'm not fiercely opposed to, say, black nationalism or Palestinian nationalism, because they're rallying cries for dis dispossessed people. We can support them. But if they turn tyrannical, like if they start eating babies, it's okay to turn your back on them. While some Marxists do great work challenging the status quo, I fear too many of them want to keep too much of this system. Maintaining social hierarchy, promoting nationalism, using the nation-state system, and keeping capitalist relations of production is not revolutionary. This, this status quo thinking on how to get things done is there are two basic ways, right? The market and government, while the non-profit sector, you know, tries to fill in the holes left by the other two, but relies entirely on them to exist. To a communist, in other words, someone who believes in workers' control, in common ownership of the means of production, the answer to how things get made is the free association of producers. That's as, a, as accurate an answer as you can give in the present. MLs who think they're being clever will make fun of anarchists for not mapping out precisely how glasses or clothes or nuclear reactors will be made under communism. How's anyone supposed to know that? If your only answer is you'll replace the market with the state, you don't have an answer either. Anti-authoritarianism is the only consistent approach to liberation and justice. It's based on unconditional solidarity, as opposed to solidarity only with those people and states in your group that government and media haven't declared a criminal. Revolution requires a whole reimagining of the world. If you simply reproduce the same institutions, you'll recreate the same world. You want to eliminate social hierarchy? Then eliminate the state. You want to improve working conditions? Let producers organize autonomously. And get rid of the factory, the high-rise office building, and, and so on, and replace them with public space. These are outmoded institutions that would not exist in a free society. But then, most leftists don't seem to want a free society. They want to replace the current authorities. But I think we can do better than that.